I'm James Rink. I am a super soldier. And I also have Joseph Powell here today. And he is a government hybrid and galactic starseed who was utilized in Project IBIS and Mannequin. He has also served as an officer in various MyLab and SSP groups, including Solar Warden, German Mars Defense Force, Nachtwaffen, the Merchant Marine Fleet, Ashtar Command, and also a few Earth units. He has decided to come forward to share his experiences as a self-appointed mission on his self-appointed mission to stop the abduction and abuse of children and to help assist waking up as many super soldiers as possible for the coming threat to humanity. That is an intergalactic battle with various regressive ET and German factions, which are seeking domination of our timeline. He's going to go into that in just a bit. Today, we'll be discussing some of Josh's, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph's experiences, uh, including uh, his self-awakening process and his vision for what he would like to see for the future of humanity. I'll be sure to put the link for his contact information in the video uh, when it goes, when this goes public. So, uh, Joseph, are you there? Yep. Great. Thank you for joining us today. Do you want to add anything else to that bio? No, that pretty much covers everything. Uh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so let's go ahead and begin maybe with the first question here. Uh, so uh, I'm not too familiar, too familiar of your life uh, experiences. Cause I know you've done, you've done a few interviews already and um uh, why don't we just go ahead and just start from the beginning so uh, audience members who are um, not aware of you uh, can learn a little bit more about how you actually were groomed or recruited into these SSP projects. So, and by the way, if you need me to turn on any pictures, just just shout out me. I'll, I'll, I'll do the screen share. Okay. Um, well, I know like the, the first time I was taken, uh, dealt with Project Ibis um, slash mannequin. And uh, they took me into an underground base. Like they picked me up out of my crib. They knocked everybody else out. Like everybody was put to sleep. That was in the house that I was in um, from what I've been told. And um, I got taken, picked up by this female. She was wearing a, a Nazi uniform. She had a swastika um, band on her arm and everything like that. I think she had like black hair. Uh, it was like to her shoulders. And she took me out of the crib. And then I was taken to a to an underground base um, where we were. Most of these kids were given like individual rooms where they had uh, one way mirrors um, in them. And then you would have like a soldier that was there uh, that would be decked out in all black, uh, like an all black uniform. And he would have a SS symbol on his uh, left hand chest piece. Um, and then they would have uh, actual officers. Uh, like an officer that would come in that would be dressed in uh, an officer, uh, German officer uniform. And they had, uh, yeah, this, like, this one, exactly like that pretty much. Yep. Um, they had uh, their armband and stuff like that on the right hand side. You can see the one way mirror and then right behind them is the door entrance. And then we were placed in like cribs and this is where we would normally sleep and stuff like that. They would put uh whatever animal they were going to have us try to uh, take on the attributes of inside the crib with us. And we would basically live with them um, and bond with them. And in the one way mirror, they would have somebody on the other side who would either be um, an officer, a uh, scientist or a doctor. Um, and they would basically watch us and, and observe what we did um, as they put us through different uh, processes. I remember, um, being brought in there, I remember them putting up like a video um, eventually where they played uh, some kind of some kind of thing that would show the queen mother and then it would fluctuate to a, a female wolf and then it would fluctuate to, to say mother on the screen. Um, and then after that, it would fluctuate and show like uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of the. Uh, like Nazis marching in a loop so that it looked like there was a bunch of them. That's, that's how they were trying to brainwash us into the thousand year Reich process. Um, and that's a photo basically that I put together that dealt with the wolf. Like they would bring up, they brought a wolf pup in. Um, and each time they would play, cause like there would be one with George Bush. This has been covered by like Michael Prince or James Caswell. Um, that was part of the same, uh, same program as well. Um, and what they did is once they once they got us bonded together, they would bring another child in 
and put them in the crib with us. And like when, what they did with me is they put some food in there and, you know, they gave, they would let us go hungry a little so that we would want to sit there and, and uh, try to go for the food. And when they did uh, this other kid that was in there, like his whole head shifted he like looked back and like hissed at me and his face like shifted into like, uh, like a snake. And I like lurched back. I remember like, I remember seeing that and stuff like that. Um, and that I did it as well later on with other kids. Uh, eventually, uh, what had happened is, uh, we would be walking around and the soldiers that were there, they were like really cold blooded. They wouldn't talk to you. Uh, they were ready to shoot you at any, like just at a moment's notice. Um, and they they had like the the black paint around their on their face um to the point you could see it like coming out of like from the mask the black mask that they would wear as well um around their eyes and like their eyes were just like piercing cold blood it was crazy and i mean they wouldn't even talk to you i remember like looking up and like smiling at one of them and he just sat there and like stared at me and like held his rifle in his hand (laughs) um and then like we were taken out like taken and put them in the crib or whatever you know eventually the cribs uh turned into like almost like a bed because we I, I remember like aging as i was there um we were there for a bit and then i remember the place getting attacked by another by another nazi faction um and they were uh once they attacked uh that officer that was there came in and leveled a pistol at me there was another child in the room and he shot the child in front of me I just didn't put the child in there because I didn't want to portray something like that. Um, they shot, he shot one of the kids in front of me. And I remember using telepathy and taking over his mind and stopping him because he was leveling the pistol to shoot me next. And um, right when that happened, um, the, the soldiers that were in the back that are in the background, uh, they came through and shot him in the head and executed him. Um, and then they ended up taking us to a, a skyscraper um, that had like cots and stuff, uh, in Canada, which has been covered again by, uh, by James. And, um, that, once we were taken there, there James, was a bunch James of Casbold. Yeah. James Casbold, not, not you, but, um, or Michael Prince, I'll just say Michael Prince. So people don't get mixed up. Uh, we were taken with, a, I was taken with a bunch of other kids. Uh, we had different numbers. I re, um, I've been told that my number was number 42. Um, but there was like girls and boys there and we were all in this, in this area where you could oversee like this landscape. And it was in Canada, like that location has been found and, and covered in, a, in an interview with him. And um, while we were there, I remember a girl walking up and, and holding my left hand. Um, and there was like this Nazi dude, like he was dressed in a, a SS officer uniform. He had, uh, like I said, blonde hair, he was already explained before, but he had blonde hair that went into like, like grayish, like white, basically. Um, and he basically told us that we would be, uh, we would be set free. Um, <laughs> but we would be staying there for a while and they fed us and gave us uh, beds to sleep in. And then eventually we were transferred to a base. Um, so we, from my recollection, we weren't actually ever set free. Uh, we actually grew up and, were part of a military faction uh, that we would we would go and uh, hunt down alien beings or people that were threat a threat to the program or to what was going on behind the scenes. Um, was this was this, part of that? this this is when you got rescued? No, no, that was, no, no, no. That was a separate. That that was when I was um, in the third grade. Uh, this was part of. That was the hallway uh, and one of the bases that, that we were that I was taken to and most of our most of the kids that were in the programs were taken to where we would um, there would be an officer on the other side of the one way mirror there and we were brought in and it would be a there would be like a some kind of duty look like you know the, the average CIA guy basically that you would perceive would be sitting in this in, in a chair with the desk in front of him and then he would have us execute a guy with a black bag over his head that was sitting in the corner. This has been covered by various uh, people that become public. Uh, but that was what the hallway looked like. And I remember we showed up early uh, because I failed to uh, to shoot the guy originally and I was brought back again. 
um, and we ended up showing up really early. And there was another kid that was already in the room that was going through it. This kid, um, which hasn't become public, his or and I haven't met him yet, but he had like dirty blonde hair that like went down to his uh, shoulders. But I like I was standing off on the right hand side after the the like the scientist and the guy that would train us had an argument about me being there too early. Uh, and this kid killed both the people that were in the room and then came out in the hallway and like leveled his leveled the pistol at me and basically said something like, are you an enemy or a foe? Or are you not, are you a, a, an enemy or an ally? And I was like, what? And he was like, enemy or ally. And I was like, I'll be your friend, you know? <laughs> and he, he was like, he just stopped and like, I could see when I was looking into his eyes, like he was, he was so alone, you know? And like, I felt that because I, we were in the same program. And uh, when that happened, uh, the, the scientist like came out the door and was like, it's over, it's done. You don't have to shoot anybody. It's over. Okay. You know, cause like the kid like leveled the pistol at him next, you know, cause he was just ready to kill everybody. Like I was surprised he didn't shoot me, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I remember that like clear as day. So it's, it's pretty interesting to find that there was a lot of other kids that like went on rampages like that. I remember eventually just saying, fuck it, just killing the, the guy that was in the corner because they, they wouldn't stop. Like they were like, kill him. You know, when it first happened, I would ask questions like, well, who is he? Why? I don't understand. You know, and then you just like pick up a pistol and execute him. Uh, and the point of that was just to get us processed, just to kill without hesitation. But that was later on though. Um, but that was part of, of the childhood version. I remember eventually um, when I got older, uh, dealing with the Project Divis uh, slash uh, group that I was with, um, I remember like they took me out of a lot of time and space. So I remember being older than James was and James covered uh, this encounter that we had with this uh, wolf bait. Um, that was when he first came out. And um, I was the individual that was able to teleport and run up the tree and stuff that he talked about. Um, he was there and he was basically put in charge and we were meant to follow him. And I remember having a problem with that because he was so young. Um, and he was there tracking this, this uh, wolf, uh, wolf humanoid. And like he had this wolf humanoid, he had a brown cloak and then he had like this armor underneath um, that went across, there was like a circular chest piece uh, that was like right here and like it went down and he had, um, he had a plasma rifle that shot like purple plasma and he killed, I believe two of the soldiers that were there with us originally because he was up in the tree line, he killed the two soldiers, went to go kill uh, Michael Prince um, and like there was another person there that had another ability that stopped him from dying. And I remember like getting pissed because he killed two of my men, uh, two of the people that were on my unit. So I ran up the, uh, I ran up the tree line. Sorry, sorry um, guys. Sorry guys. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I'm having problems here. <clears throat> Give me a moment. I'm trying to reset something. You, uh, and you're doing a great job there. Uh, just go ahead and yeah, get that started again. I was trying to get, okay. Uh, I just want to get your video pin and then we can get this going. Oh, can you can you can you turn your webcam back on? Click accept. It's not on. No, just turn it turn it off and turn it back on. Uh, sorry, buddy. Uh, actually, you know what I'll do is I'll sh I want to share the screen because this uh, here's the here's the picture of um, when you were there with the uh, the guy the CIA guy and the hat. Yes. Uh, yeah, that would be. Um that would be the room that I was in where they would have us shoot, uh, shoot the guy in the corner. Okay. Um, and he was like off to the right hand side and then you would, you would be sitting there and they would place a pistol in front of you. And normally there was like, uh, there was a round and like you had to chamber the round that was in the, uh, the magazine. And, um, there would be an officer, like a military officer on the other side, uh, and with a few scientists and stuff and they would be watching you and reviewing like how your interaction was and stuff like that. Joseph, can you, I'm going to stop your video. Can you, can you turn it back on again? Thanks. And then, uh, well, we also got this one here. Uh, I guess this was, um, this is, 
was this the friend the friend or the foe oh okay so you, uh, i guess you have to yeah so no no that was me um that that's what basically it looked like when i had to when i pulled up the pistol to shoot um to shoot the guy in the head that was in the corner except for i wasn't smiling it's just i don't have any photos as a kid but when i like not smiling um mainly because of the fact that my parents always told me that if i was taking a photo i had to smile because they had to pay to get it you know that it, it, normally like you had to pay a place to have your photos uh brought out and it costs money so you better smile that's what i was always taught <laughs> okay. okay um uh, i remember like bawling my eyes out sometimes and then eventually i just got frustrated and i i just was like i don't know dead okay. in a sense you know jaded all right, all right. Uh, can you get your camera on please you ha you actually have to turn it on it says uh you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it try there it go. yay okay uh so okay. i want it let me try this again let's uh yes we got you in there there we go all right Okay. All right. So, um, so, um, let me ask, uh, let me ask, ask the members in the chat. Um, do you see a gallery view? Oh, wait, there it goes. Now we're on a gallery view. All right. So now let's go ahead and go to the next topic. Uh, wait, so we were on project mannequin Ibis. Um, can you give us an idea? Uh, so they were trying, I, I had some questions about that. So you were in the cage with uh and they were training you with the various animal and typically they mm -hmm. would pick one animal per, per per person in the cage that they want to train you with and were they was the goal for you to shape shift into this particular type of animal or gain its uh, attributes the, sure so it was like it was to gain so the process that i recall uh like if you pay attention with like how i explained the queen mother and the wolf and then mother right so she she is actually there she has an altar too uh like real real time and um the point of it was is to do deal with like the romulus and remus situation you know where you had the two child two children that were raised by the wolf that fed you fed them and you know kept them alive and then they ended up you know becoming you know the heroes of their time whatever you know um but that was the process so it was like they wanted us to take on the attributes of the animals and stuff like that because they wanted us to be the frontline soldiers for the thousand year life. That's that's the variant. But what we would do is we would we would live with these these animals in in the crib with us, and you know they would be fed with us and we would basically like cuddle with them, you know, and lay with them and like live with them basically until we started taking on like their attributes, like being able to smell or growl or uh, see things, you know, just uh, until we shape, like we could shape shift in a sense. That's when they knew that it was, that you were processing it properly. Um, but uh, they did it with different animals. Like first they would do it with one set of animals and they would have certain videos that they would show. And then it, like with, uh, with like the snakes, I mean, that's been covered, but it dealt with like, you know, uh, a snake. Uh, and that dealt with George Bush and like, it would be like a, the, the reptilian side. Um, and then it like he would shape, it would shape shift and like, there would be different stuff for that. I'm, I don't have a lot of memories of that um, with the video that they played for that, but that was just, they would do the videos and then they would bring in the animal and it would be a, it would be like a, a baby form of the animal and you would just grow a connection to it. Yeah. Uh, so um and i actually like to share this uh this is uh something i wrote about the flying cobra division um and i know i know you have a lot of information to share so i don't want to i don't want to take too much information time, time on my stuff here because um but but my Fine. yeah but this this overlaps what you're what what you're discussing however i think this facility was on mars not necessarily like project ibis so um, yeah, I, I'll just skim through some some parts of it and read some parts that I think are I feel are relevant. But uh, yeah, it was a Nazi facility, and then uh, the children uh, the children were not actually exposed to some of the guys in the lab coats. They were kept behind like the uh, the, the mirror walls, but they they would monitor vital signs. And then um, in this particular facility, they would have us stacked in cages in like a large hallway, so we're all together. 
And then um, yeah, typically, yeah, we, we didn't have any clothes on, although maybe later on they gave us some clothes. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes they wouldn't give us any food at all. They let us starve to death. But when they did give us food, it was usually dog food. Um, I don't know, Joseph, does it, does that ring a bell to you? Do you, do you remember the dog food? Um, I remember, uh, when I got picked up by Notch Wolf and, um, and they were gonna, they, they were, they were, um, trying to force me to work with them. Um, before they put me in the trip chair, I remember them bringing in kids that were, that were in cages and the cages, I think were like stacked up like three to four high. And then like, lengthwise i don't remember how many cages there were because i was laying on a table but uh i remember like they were first they tortured me and then they start like they brought in an alien being tortured them and then they brought in all these kids that were like feral like they were you know i mean they were broken basically you know um and they began the process to start torturing them in front of me and that's when i said that i was i would work for them um but yeah i remember the treat that they that they gave one of them i, I believe was uh, a piece of kibble Exactly. All right. So let's go on here. Uh, yeah. So, and I do, yeah, they put snakes and different types of animals in the cages. Uh, but it's curious, you're saying that they're trying to make a connection with that particular animal. Um, so let's move on here. So then, uh, yeah, all the kids, these kids seem to be telepathically linked to each other. And so if one of them is tortured, the rest of the children feel it. Or if one of them sees yeah, somebody coming, great. yeah, the, the whole group of them. So, and I still think these children are all telepathically linked, even to this day, even though maybe they try to like break all that up. Okay, so um, uh, beyond the passageway is a transparent door where there's torture rooms. And then, uh, so let's go on here. I'm going to skip some of this stuff, so we just move through this quickly. Uh, so I see myself there in this facility, and I telepathically ask, you know, from – send a message and like in a regression and so on uh, to stay strong, stay strong, stay strong. I know I'm going to be out. And so like my older self was contacting my younger self. That's basically what's happening here. And uh, yeah, so we are, are running over this group consciousness. And then, uh, then, then there's a room with a trip seat. Uh, there's two people in there. Uh, one of them would inject us in our back with serum that they said would make us immortal. By the way, these, they are Nazis here. And uh, one person said, put James there and strap him. And then the other lady, she said um, something about the rise of the Phoenix and you can hear sc kids screaming in the background. And then they put like some kind of Darth Vader, like mask or visor over my head and I would black out. And then um, I guess, yeah. And that was all in the trip chair and the trip chair is where they reprogram your memories. So then, uh, then they, they, uh, there was another room where there was a white screen and they would make us stare into it to be programmed. They would repeat these words like obey or something in that lines. And we I see somebody in there with a black Nazi uniform and he's beating his rubberized stick in his hand like this. And he's uh, and his voice ranges from nice to evil. And he tells me, if you don't do it, you know what I'll do. And then I, yeah, so he's beating a stick. And then the other lady, she's, she's standing there too. And she has this blank emotionless face and the cold, soft voice says, you heard what he says. He wants you to do that. And then, so yeah, they train us like Pavlov dogs. Uh, you know, that's when they had the, like, the, the bell for people who don't know about that, but you, sh you probably should because this is basic Nazi programming here. And so they would use trigger words and then, uh, yeah. So, um, Anyway, and they had another room. It was a holographic room where they used for trainer torture, training, torture, and tr testing, like uh, the violet rabbit, the violet rabbit ritual. So this is where they would ask a child questions, telling them terrible things to make them want to run away into a hologram of a labyrinth. So it's like a virtual reality scenario. So when the children run away, they enter the tunnels, and they would feel the squeezing and pulling sensation. And sometimes the child would get lost because it's like a portal. And at the end, they lose their energy and collapse and their energy body comes out of their physical body and then they're fractured. Uh, so, um, and then there's another room with a glass tank with crocodiles and snakes inside of it. And they would, yeah, they force the kids to, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not so wanting to go into all this. They also had this other room with a, like a round bird cage with a rubber looking pedestal. They would spin this, they would spin you in this pedestal and hit you with baseball bats and of course, they also, you know, they dunk your head in water. Um, do you remember that? Did, do, do they do that? The, 
waterboarding. Yeah, I remember being waterboarded, but that was when I was uh, when I was like around eight or nine. Do you also recall the strange looking hooks? They would put us, they hang us on hooks for pain pleasure reversals. There was like a, it looked like a harp, harp on hook, a double prong. A harpoon and, hook. Yeah. yeah and they, I know what you're talking about. And they, they put, they, they, they would hang you up on your back. Uh, yeah. Uh, I remember like there was a church, um, like I, I discussed it in private with somebody. There was like a church that we were brought to where they hung, hung some of us. Hung some of them on on uh, on hooks. Um, it was like a big cathedral kind of church. It was weird, but uh, and then they had us do like some rituals, some stuff. Yeah. All right. So I don't remember specifically that location um, that you're talking about, but like I don't know when you were going when you were going through it. Like I, I got like a somewhat of a headache, so I'm pretty sure there's something there. Uh, you might have been there. Uh. Uh, yeah, and then I'm going to go ahead and just leave it at that. Uh, the rest, you know, you can go check my website. That is, if you want to read more about that, click on the uh, Flying Cobra Division on uh, supersoldertalk.com. So let's go back to, um, so I guess at this point, you're you're pretty much out of IBIS. Um, you moved on to yeah, another project. Um, uh, yeah, basically, we, we were working for the people that saved us. I, see, and I don't know if they were two different Nazi factions or not. What it seemed like to me is they were trying to create some kind of a hero situation so that we would look up the group that saved us from the oppressors, you know, and then, but they were still the same in a sense, you know, they still had the same belief structures, but they never really talked much about the thousand year right when I was in the, in that group, we were just, we were, we were the top, the top tier that would hunt down the aliens and stuff um, that weren't allowed to be there like here on the planet and stuff. Uh, they didn't have permission. So we would go and be the ground troops that would go and hunt them down. Um, anyways, like I remember like with, with, with that whole situation, like I chased that wolf to a point where he got to a ship and I was way ahead of the rest of the people that were a part of the unit that I was with. And I remember the wolf turning around and it kind of got scared because I cornered him before he could get on a ship and I was going to kill him. And then he sat there and was like, I'm just here to find my wife, like his, his wife or his, his female counterpart. And when he said that, I remembered, you know, having my connection with the wolf pup and like him being my friend because he was my only friend. And, um, I, like something happened in that moment and I just, I stopped and I didn't like, I just, I let, I listened to him. I was like, well, I can't let you go or I'll get in trouble. And he said, don't worry. And then he shot, he used his, his plasma rifle to shoot the tree branch that I was on. And I went to go fall. I was able to catch myself, balance myself on the ground eventually. And use like, tell it, like I basically teleported to the, the ground before I fell. And um, he got on the ship and took off. Well, later on, I was on the base that I was at and he showed up on this base. And he basically, from what I can remember when I was in the conversation with the officer that, that was in charge of, in charge of me um, on the base. He sat there and told me that he was like, why did you let this being go? And I was like, you know, I was already shocked enough to see him there. And then he was like, what do you expect? You know, <laughs> like this being was like, what do you expect? He was like, I couldn't get off the planet. So now I'm going to work for the same people that you're working for. And he was like, you shouldn't have trusted me. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? So I got reprimanded for that. Um, and then later on, there was another, with that faction, there was another um, being that we hunted down, which is in the photo that, that I sent you with just the head. Um, we were in like this jungle setting and, and this being was hiding in the mountains in, in these rocky mountains up in this jungle. And we finally tracked him down and he had this ability to like subdue us, like subdue beings. So this is an actual photo. Uh, they did an interview and that interview was taken, taken down. Uh, but those those kids that are in the background, they were actually playing. So we had to cut through this this area where they were living. These these people were living to get to that 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 being. And you can tell like his eyes are sunk into its head because of the decay and stuff. Um, they obviously didn't put it on ice. Um, but the thing that's in his head. So what we did is we finally tracked him down. And there was a unit of us. Uh, so there was uh, it was me. Uh, Michael Jacob was part of that unit. Um, 
Anthony Zender was part of that unit. Um, it was like a five person team and I, and there was like a, two other people. I can't remember off the top of my head what their names are. Um, but we went there, we hunted this being down. Uh, we were going through these catacombs in this mountain to try to track him and he could sit there and paralyze you. Uh, and he had like some kind of like wings in a sense, but he would bring him up and then it would cause paralysis. And I remember like, I finally caught up to him and like we had paralysis. Uh, I ended up being put in a, into a paralysis state and I think it was Anthony Zender that caught up and killed the being. And then I remember like running up and jumping and stomping on its head, uh, like repeatedly. Um, and uh, afterwards, Anthony Zender like ripped his head off. And that's why it's all torn out at the bottom. Um, and then when we were headed back, so the, the cleanup crew that would show up to, to pick up these bodies, these alien bodies and stuff, they were used to Anthony taking the heads because he got the taxidermy on the base, you know, because we didn't have much to do on the base that we lived on. So he would take the heads of, uh, of our enemies. I think that was like number eight or number 10. Uh, that he took at that point. And uh, he took that thing that the guy is holding in his head. He picked it up as we were walking back through this little village. Uh, he picked that up and he stuck it in the head so he could hold it because he was getting like the blood and stuff on his hands. And um, he was sitting there and the two kids that were in the back, like the one that's hanging on the fence and the one that's in the background, he was sitting there and he was fucking with the kids as we were walking by. And he was like, rah, you know, and like fucking scaring the shit out of him. <laughs> and, you know, he was like, I was like, Hey, you want to see something cool? You know? Cause like he already freaked us out. Like most of us, when he would do his taxidermy and shit, cause he just started doing that randomly. Like he was like, that ultra was like losing his shit. So I was like, Hey, you want to see something cool? I was like, give me the head and didn't know for sure. And like, if you wanted to do it and I was like, come on, man, give me the head. So he handed me the head and I fucking tossed it over the fence into that yard. And it was off to the right hand side where it landed. And uh, the kids were like, they came up and ran up and saw it, and they were like poking it with a with a stick. <laughs> and uh, I remember Anthony being like, "Hey, man, that was mine." And I was like, "Ah, oh, don't worry about it." I was like, "It's not like they." Here's the funny part. I was like, "It's not like they have cameras." I was like, "They're backwater. Like they live in the backwater. You know, they're yokels." And <laughs> lo and behold, they did have camera a camera. <laughs> but that's the same stick that they were poking it with. It's in the kid's hand too. So it's pretty, uh, pretty neat to actually see that. So, um, anyways, yeah. So like we were leaving and like when I was doing that, Michael Jaco's altar, uh, clone that was there, I was like, Hey, you should, you know, you should be a little nicer, you know, cause he, he has this thing where like on the base, he's like a pastor's like new age pastor kind of person, you know, and he likes to get people to try to come in, but nobody ever wants to go into his place to listen to him. But <laughs> You know, uh, you know, and it's like on the base, we have a TV and a game and the game that we have is like the foosball game, you know, so we hit the foosball back and forth and stuff like that. Um, so we don't really do much, but we're able to see the outside world. And we started getting frustrated at this point uh, with the fact that the average people don't know about what we're doing. And we're we, we got to the point where we got tired of doing the shit we were doing, which, you know, uh, Michael Prince talked about. That's why he came out. He was the only person that was one of our unit leaders that was able to actually leave the base on average, just because like we don't, we left the base when we were on mission. He got to leave the base whenever. So we, me and a few others went and talked to him and like Max Spears has had an altar that was there. And eventually like once Michael Prince came out, some shit happened and uh, we thought that that Max Spears was a traitor. So like we went on a mission to hunt him down and kill him. And that's how he ended up dying. Um, we had uh, his girl's uh, activation codes for her sex altar and stuff. And what we did is we showed up, uh, we talked to the chief of police and we basically told him that we, we were with an agency and he knew that we were with a certain agency, uh, which freaked him out. And we told him that we were going to be operating in his, uh, in his territory. And then the guy that, that dealt with the morgue stuff. He's the one who gave us the drug to inject, uh, inject Max Spears with, and he has money like in an offshore account because of that. We ended up giving him money to cover up his murder. Um, when Max, we hit Max Spears, yeah, for people don't uh, know. When we hit, 
So, so when we went in, so if you look at the Thai, Thai, Taiwanese military, like special forces with the black mask and stuff, that's the kind of uniform that we had. Um, I went in with, with a, with that same unit pretty much, except for, I think there was like, I can't, like, I don't know. I can't remember. Like I wrote it down, like the individuals that, that were there, a part of that unit, uh, Max Spears himself was there with us and he's the one who injected him and me and another person held him down while he was injecting him. Um, but he was, he was sleeping on the couch, uh, in, in that place. Yeah, that was, that was, that's who it was. It, um, that's actually it. Uh, he was, he was sleeping on this couch, it had like black and gold. And then like, it had like the French tr like trim around it that was made of gold. That was uh, like not real gold, but like painted on. Um, and that's what he was laying on when he showed up and, and he was asleep. So what we did is we knocked on the door and when, when, uh, when she had opened the door, we used her sex kit and altered activation code on her. And when we did that, she started like messing around. And like, we told her, you know, cause she wouldn't leave us alone. Like we told her that if uh, to turn us on, she should stand still and stand by the door. And that would satisfy us. So she stood by the door and didn't move. And then we went in, uh, we went in and went through like this, this arch thing into the, into this room, into this uh, living room setting. And uh, that's where we uh, ended up killing him. Like, so Max was sitting there and he was like, when he woke up, he was holding his, uh, his black dragon with the gold key. And he's like, don't take it off, you know, because he remembers how he dies every time he comes through, comes back. Like he's in a loop as well. Um, so just, it is what it is, you know? Um, but yeah, so he was sitting there. He's like, just don't take it off. Don't take it off. I don't want to come back, you know? So I remember like grabbing his, like grabbing his necklace as he was saying that, like his altar. I don't, and like the way I think it is, it's like we weren't in altars. We were the actual real individuals, but uh, we were just out of time and space, you know, basically like they just took us out of time and space when we were a part of this project. So he ended up injecting, uh, injecting him in the neck and he didn't die either, but Max Spears did, you know, um, and he was like, yeah, I think we ended up taking his necklace or we, I think that this time we might have left it. I can't remember 100%. It's still kind of fuzzy what it deals with that. But once we left, we deactivated her altar, her code, and like shut the door. Um, and that's when she ended up like going, seeing, finding her dead and all that other shit. Uh, but that's that's pretty much the only memories I have of number 42. Uh, awesome. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. All right. So uh, I'm assuming this because you were on planet earth this this was part of the earth defense force perhaps i don't know we never had a name we just we worked for this i think it was like the mi i think i think michael prince called it mi6 or some shit like that's just the unit we were with it was like a like a canadian or or, or british kind of situation but i also remember like we used to push like when he when michael prince talks about pushing drugs like we were pushing drugs for a white draco that sits on sits on a crystal and black throne, and uh, and like just the location where that's at. But I remember like we would we would push drugs and stuff like that. So a lot of what he came out and talked about, like that shit actually happened, you know. Uh, so when, when I remember him push, being when you say push drugs, that means uh, moving drugs around for public consumption. Yeah, like moving drugs around Fueling. so that yeah, so it could hit the streets. And the, the whole point, the whole point of that process was because, you know, you want to soften the battlefield. If you get a bunch of people drugged up, they're easier and more open to doing what you want them to do and conform. And it also destroys and deteriorates the community at large. So it makes it a lot easier. So like if you decide to finally do an invasion of the planet, I mean you have a bunch of doped out, you know, people that are just more worried about meaningless shit. Uh, or their lives are already destroyed, so they they won't know what's going to hit them. But that was the point. Okay. Uh, yeah. Someone comment here. Speaking of severed heads, last year my mom tried to give me a stainless steel cooking pot with severed heads. It completely freaked me out in a public restaurant. Um, I don't know, uh, Thomas. That sounds like maybe some kind of virtual reality scenario uh, they're trying to traumatize you. But um, okay. Uh, well, at what point were you connected with Tony Rodriguez at the uh, Misty Isles place? Because, uh, you know, for those of you for sure. listeners yeah, who, who don't know who Tony Rodriguez is, Misty Isles, that's a, a farm um, uh, that he was taken to prior to his training in the SSP, 
And he was actually brought there because he insulted another boy that was involved in these, I guess, the Illuminati or whatnot, what you want to call these groups. Uh, so um, what was your penance, I guess you could say, for uh, what did they, what did you do to, to end up, that made you end up in Misty Isles along with Tony and some of the other kids? Okay, so um, we'll jump to that then. Uh, all right, so what had happened with that situation is it was like around the time that I was like 12 or 14 years old, uh, I had a situation where, um, what was it? There was like three different craft that showed up on the same day that picked me up. The first craft was, uh, the first craft that had shown up to pick me up was for Solar Warden. Uh, the second craft was the, uh, the Ashtar Command. And then the third craft that showed up right afterwards was Notch Waffen a notch waffen uh, craft. You could pull up the photo. I have a photo of like a, uh, an outwards view. Uh, and that was like the property that I lived on. And then there was a close up. Um, but they had basically the ship with the iron cross on it. Is this it? Yeah. The desert. Yeah. So that's, that's the, yeah, that's the outward view. That's actually the property that I used to live on um, where I would be picked up and stuff. Um, but I, I stayed in a trailer that was off like right where that ship was, wherever the ship is located at the bottom area. There, there was a, um, a trailer that I stayed in and like off to the left hand side, there was a property. Uh, and then there was a, a separate house and trailer that was on the left hand side, which is outside of the picture. Um, but like my mom stayed in that in that area and like i ended up moving at, into this trailer when i was when i was 12 to 14 and like she would be gone to work most of the time and like my parents had separated at that point um so i was basically there by myself most of the time when i wasn't at school and i normally just stopped going to school because i i just hated going to school <laughs> um but yeah so i ended up getting picked up by the third craft the third craft uh yeah there it is uh the third craft had grabbed me so I got picked up and then like, then I got picked up by that, that one. So I was already freaked out as, as it was. And I was calm in that moment because of, of being a part of the Ashtar command. Like I knew why they were there and why they were leaving kind of, but most of my memories were erased of it. But then this one showed up and like, at this point I was able to feel the emotions of the individual beings that were in the craft, like whether they were scared or unknowing or happy or whatever. This one was maniacal. So I turned to run and I was taken, you know, I was in the process of running into the trailer thinking, you know, cause I was a kid thinking that I was going to save me, <laughs> that they couldn't get to me or something, you know? Um, and they ended up taking me and that's where I got brought in. And I started, I started being put on this table and I was tortured like repetitively by this fucking crazy scientist. Like it was like this guy that looked, that was dressed in like a lap coat, like a scientist. And, you know, he was just, he had like black hair. I can't remember what his eye color was, but like, I remember his eyes. I just can't remember his iris color, but it was like, every time he looked at me, he was like nuts. And then there was a female that was there that had like short blonde hair and blue eyes. And um, she would be quiet, but would watch what's going on and observe. Um, and as he was, he would torture me with like a cattle prod. He would tor he would sit there and like, I, and I would pass out and then, come back to and then when I would come back to sometimes like they would cut my hand off and I remember like taking up and like having not having my hand there and like feeling that it, there was a hand there but there wasn't you know like a ghost hand in a sense so I was like freaked out about that and then, like he tortured me again they would he would normally speak he spoke English but he would normally speak German and I don't know why I know that I just know that they were speaking German and I couldn't understand what they were saying so I got tortured for a bit and then eventually they brought in this, uh, they brought in these empty cages, like dog cages that were big enough for like a, uh, a Rottweiler or a, a canine, you know, um, a medium sized dog and they lined them up and shit and they were empty. And then like the next time after I got, I started getting tortured again and then I came up, they were different than that. They weren't, I think that was a, that looks This was from the Montauk project. Yeah, Montauk. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, By the way, Joseph. Anyways, uh, the. Uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, I. If there was a whole aspect of the Ashtar thing, let's. let's we can go into that next because I think that was all tied into that. And I, I apologize if I. If I. If we jumped around too fast, but. But go ahead and finish. Finish up. 
That's oh, okay. We can go into it. Um. So yeah. So like they tortured me, and then like they brought in this like adult size cage that you could stand in, and they had like this blue alien being that had like a bald shaped head, and like I think he had like red eyes. Um. Like his his like whole thing was red, and I remember like this was after the Ashtar situation. So I remember like shifting altars, and like I remember like being in an altar that remembered like, you know seeing beings in a different light you know so like i was telepathically contact contacting them and we were talking back and forth and i remember like sitting there telling them i'm sorry i'm sorry they're doing this to you you know it's not right you basically telepathically responded with what do you expect from your people or what do you expect from your kind and like i remember like saying you know it's not we're not all the same and shit like that you know like he didn't really give a fuck he basically saw us as just assholes you know um just violent not like violent narcissists you know that's just the feeling that i got from them um but anyways like i remember being tortured again and passed out well eventually that that individual in the cage was removed and and that that big cage was removed and then they filled up um the rest of the cages with these kids that were like in rags they were wearing like rags um or some of them were some of them you know, some of them were kind of like not naked fully, like they had like some kind of underwear on. Um, but I remember them being like all dirty and like you could smell, you could like smell them. You know, it was really bad. Uh, but the individual had walked up and was like getting ready to take and like think like like Smeagol from Lord of the Rings, how he acted. That's the way this kid was acting and would talk in a way you know so he started moving back to the so like the cage door opened from left to right so he went to go open the cage to grab this kid to go hurt him and he backed up into the the, the left hand corner of the cage and all the kids were like ah freaking out at the same time you know and like they would like you know uh move the cage and stuff and it would rattle and stuff like that but they all freaked out when he went to go grab one of the kids because they didn't know who he was going to grab you know and he ended up like going to reach in to grab this kid and i was like i'll do what you want you know just don't torture any kids don't torture any kids you know and i said that he stopped and like he went and pulled with his right hand he went in and pulled like this treat out which was <laughs> which is funny because it was like a, a dog kibble and like gave it to him and the kid took it was like, hey, you know, like all giddy and happy was like looking and like the guy started laughing maniacally. So he started repeating the laughter at me as well, you know, thinking that everything was good. You know, I was like, it freaked me out. Like that whole situation freaked me out. But then I passed out and then I woke up in like this black uniform and there was an officer that was standing there and he had like black hair. I think his hair was like either black or brown, but like but it was like really dark and like the lighting was kind of red in this room. So he ended up, I wasn't, I wasn't like taken down. Like there was no, no things around my wrists or my legs anymore or my head or my chest or my head. Right. Um, Cause sometimes they would strap my head down when they were torturing me and stuff. Sometimes they wouldn't, um, but all the straps were off. So I said, he was like, are you ready? And I was like, yes. He was like, sure. You know, whatever, you know, and I got up, I set up, we walked to this, this double door and we stood in front of this door and basically like he opened it up and I freaked out because I had never seen anything like this, you know? So I was like, Whoa. And he was like, uh, it's like, how'd you do that? He's like, with my mind. And I was like, what? He's like, don't worry about it. And we walked to the left-hand side down this hallway and the floor was made of like catwalk, like a catwalk basically, but it was, it, it was the entire floor and it was black. Um, and we walked through, went to the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, there was another door and we went through that door and then there was this chair, this black chair with chrome metal on it. And um, he, he was like, here, we walked in, he was like, sit, sit down on the chair and lay down. So I was like, okay. And I was like, what are we doing? He was like, you're going to be taken on your first mission. And I was like, what's, what's my mission? He was like, don't worry about it. You'll find, you'll know about the mission when it's time. Is this the chair? So I laid back. Yeah. So I laid back and I remember like there was like this white light that was uh, like that came in front of me. Like it was kind of like really, really bright. And then all of a sudden it turned into like this blue and white swirl kind of situation. And like there was like a black 
like a blackish white center. And eventually when I got to the end, it turned into like almost white. And then I ended up, I ended up like coming to in this, in this uh, clone body. Um, and I didn't know it was a clone at the time. I thought it was just me. You know, I didn't find out about it being a clone until later. So at that point, my memories jumped to me standing at this property, which was known as um, Misty Isle Farms. And a uh, person who owned, owned this property was Thomas J. Stewart. And then his wife and his wife as well. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, like I know her name, but I just can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, anyways, like it was behind their property in this dirt area. I have a photo, like a screenshot photo of this area. Yeah, so that dirt area that's behind the flag, that like the flag is covering, kind of, with a shadow. Uh, that, or no, the tree actually, that's a tree that's, that's covering it with a shadow. Um, that's the area that we were in. And off to the left-hand side, because uh, we were standing right where you have your arrow at, off to the left-hand side, they, they had the house and there was like this big light that was there that would shine through. And you could like kind of see what was going on around you. So when I was standing there, I was like, I was in these rags, like the same kind of rags that some of the kids had on the ship. And there was a girl that was on my right-hand side. And then there was two other boys that were on my left-hand side. And this guy, Caddy Corner on the left-hand side started talking. And that was, uh, his, his, his nickname was Tom to all of his friends and stuff. Uh, I came to learn his name is Master. Um, he started talking and he was like, uh, your he said something like your mind now, and I'm going to, you know, he was started talking about, you know, if you, if you try to run or you try to flee, uh, he said something along the lines of this is what's going to happen to you. And he like, I could hear this kid off to the right hand side a little further, uh, like where that tree, where the shadow of that tree line uh, ends, there was a kid off to the right hand side and he was standing there and he was like kind of shivering. And there was a guy that was, on Tom's left side and he was dressed with a, a Nazi officer uniform. Um, and there's a, I think I sent you a photo of his face. I don't know for sure. I'm not a hundred percent. Yeah. So it was like a little in the middle of like, right, right there on the second, the second, uh, the second tree line shade right at the point. Like we were standing like in the middle of it for the first one. But yeah, if you go to more to the right, that's where it was. Anyways, that's where that kid was. And this, this dude that was dressed like a Nazi officer, uh, he's actually a political figure uh, that uh, resides there that used to work for him and also has a property that's close by where his is. Uh, just this, uh, Tom, when he, when he moved there, he started buying all the proper separate parcels of land to put it together. You know, so that way nobody could hear anything like the screams and shit when they were like doing shit. Um, anyways, we were there. The kid started crying and whimpering. That was off off the side. This kid later, I came to find out, tried to escape. So the guy that was dressed in the Nazi uniform had these Doberman pinchers, which were Tom's Doberman pinchers, and he let them go. And he was like, Tom, basically, right when he said, this is what's going to happen to you. Like, if you try to run, this is what's going to happen to you. And he let the Doberman pinchers go. Both of them started running, rushing at this kid. And he started turning to run. Um, and they, uh, w one of them had grabbed his, uh, his angle, like his Achilles heel, his leg and started biting him and like tugging him down. And the other, the other, uh, the other Doberman pincher got onto his chest and started like biting his face and shit. So as this kid was screaming, uh, the, the girl that was on my, on my right hand side, like started like crying and turned her head and the two boys started whimpering that were on my left. And then because I had just been tortured. And I, I remember somewhat of the, of the stuff I went through. I just didn't know what my mission was. And that's what I was trying to figure out. Like, what's my mission here? I don't understand, you know? Um, and I, yeah, that was a second wife. Uh, she was there when she was a teenager. So she was programmed um, probably to, I don't know. She, I, I remember her being there. Um, I remember her raping me um, as well. Um, I got raped a lot when I was there. Um, but yeah, she was on the plane that, that crashed with, with him and his daughter and the pilot and her brother. Um, yeah. 
I remember crash, like jumping back. Crash in quotation like, marks. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll go. I'll go into that in a minute. But okay. Um. Anyways. Uh. So yeah. So that kid started getting tear, tore up, and then the officer had walked up and like leveled a pistol at the kid and shot him in the head. Like put him out of his misery, basically. After we got the point. And I remember like being kind of scared, but like I was, I was just disassociated, I guess would be the best, best thing that's been said. Um, I was basically disassociated from the situation. Um, and I remember right after that, he was like, follow me. And like, we walked, we were, we were basically, we followed him and the guy and we were walked up to um, the house. And then we were like, I was by myself at that point. I remember like the girl was there. I was there. And then there was another kid that was old that was already there. And when we got taken in, we got taken into the laundry room. Okay. So like you would go through the living room area and then you would go into the kitchen and then there would be a laundry room. And uh, there were two, there were three dog cages that were like worn up, like worn out, you know, and we were put in these dog cages. So it was first they put the girl in there and then there was, already the boy that was originally there. And then they put me in the left-hand side. And I remember talking to the little boy, like, what's going on? What's going to happen? He was like, you're going to die. We all die. <laughs> like He was like, totally, he already knew what was going to happen. He's like, we all end up dying. He was like, just get used to that. Get, you know, comprehend that basically. And he was like this, he already knew what was going down. He knew what time, what time it was. They took him out of the cage and he was the, the kid that was sacrificed that we had to drink his blood and eat his flesh. Um, so we ended up getting taken out of our cages after they had already killed this kid. And he was laying on, like we were taking, what happened is we were blindfolded first and they blindfolded us more than not. And um, they would put like some black blindfold over our, our eyes and we would be walked downstairs into the blind cellar. And then they would pull this, the, the, light, the light lever, the lever for the light, and then like a door would open and then we'd go into this, like this rocky cavern that they had dug out, you know, that he had had dug out and like we went through. And then there was like this uh, sacrifice, little sacrifice uh, thing that they had set up, um, which I think there's photos of it. Uh, when I, when I met him again, he was dressed in a brown cloak uh, and he had a goat's head on and he was naked underneath.